The development of AI and the consequence of its development are common tropes in many depictions of science fiction. A common theme in many of them is how the consequence is generally the displacement or the outright usurpation or subjugation of the people who originally sought to benefit from the machines they designed. Today, at the Dogstar Autonomous Facility, we shall bear witness to one such occurrence. Although, in this case, it was more the direct actions of one man and their greed, as we shall come to learn. Unfortunately, like many of the more interesting locations in Starfield, uh, this one is random. I found it on McGrath in the Narian system, but for you, this may not be the case. I'll be showing you the part of the facility that gives us more of the story and remains of the people, located to the right of the main structure we shall come to at the end, and then I'll continue with the rest. If you enjoyed this video, please show some support with a like or a comment, especially if you have suggestions for other areas you would like to see, and if you want to see more Starfield lore. Also, I'll just remind you, you need to enable notifications because I know from the comments section a lot of you haven't been being informed that my videos have been posted. I've been back for a while now, so you might have missed quite a few. Now, let's take a look at this AI-dominated mining facility. The first thing I want to show you is the habitat you can enter as soon as you arrive here. I'll also note that all the robots that are active at this facility, hence the autonomous name, are aggressive, which will lead into the story we shall unravel later. You could also enter via the walkway from the landing strip, but I prefer this way. Inside, we can find the living quarters of four of the employees here, going off of the bunk beds. One or both of the individuals of the ones closest to the door seem to have recently enjoyed a few cheeky bevs. Or they had a drinking problem. And honestly, it could be the latter given the story that unfolds here. The rest of the room looks equally lived in, as if the occupants were literally just here and stepped outside. Also, I know it's probably just a random little addition, but the eye on top of the pyramid on the whiteboard is a funny little detail. By the console beside the bed, we can get the first part of the story of this place. The log is called Obsidian Analysis and is dated the 17th of November, 2317. This place is the start of events here at just under 13 years before the beginning of the game. It talks about the magma slash obsidian composition, and whatever form it is taken, it is extremely rare, and presumably valuable. Likely, this is the reason the facility in its current form was set up, to take advantage of this composition. They state they need to work on some recipes to utilize it, though we don't have any information yet what they were intending to use it for. So at the least, we are now equipped with a rudimentary understanding of the overall goal of the facility, although this doesn't tell us where the people have gone, nor does it explain the aggression of the robots set up here. Next to that habitat, Round to the right, we can enter another one and continue to piece together the story. While being of a similar size, this habitat houses more than double the employees, so likely lower ranked than whomever it was that we just found in the previous one. Also, for some reason, someone has decided to stash some Xeno Warfare tech under their bed. Just, just sitting there. Like, like that would actually hide it? Honestly, it would have made way more sense if they were sentient AI components as that would fit into the story here a lot more. Several of the rest of the bunk beds don't seem to be in use at all, which, to me, may imply that they weren't at maximum capacity here. From what we know so far, there was room for 14 employees, with another habitat unexplored, possibly with more room. A possible cause of this may come from the data slate that we get here. This one is titled Termination Letter, and is dated the 13th of October, 2320. Almost three years after the initial analysis of the Obsidian, which presumably led to the creation of the facility. It's addressed to a Joe Show, which sounds like a fake name, if you ask me. It tells us either the name of the company that operates this facility, or the facility name, which then of course begs the question why it's called Dogstar. The name is Hephaestus, which was a smith of the Greek pantheon, notably a weaponsmith. This tells us what they were likely intending to use the obsidian here for. Apparently Joe was let go due to company restructuring, and budget cuts, and has no way to reverse the decision. This came from one Callum Troy, a name we shall see pop up several times while we're here. So, I think this may explain why some of the bunks look cleaned out, as the company was in the process of laying off its employees, likely because it was going the full automation route. I'm sure you're already building a picture in your head of how that went down, given, you know, all the aggressive robots here. 
The last habitat next to this one builds on this yet again. Now you can probably see some things just past this of interest to you, on the ground. Do not worry, we shall be addressing all of that very soon. But first, let's go into the most spacious of the habitats and take a look around. It has room for three people in it, with a double bed and a smaller one set up in the corner. Overall, it just seems to be of a much higher quality than the others we have seen thus far. This also brings the total number of people that could have been housed here to either 16 or 17, depending on whether or not the double was sleeping two people. If it was, and this was a family type of setup, the smaller one may have been for a child. This of course makes things darker, given what we shall soon be learning. However, the lack of children's toys seems to indicate this wasn't the case, which can only be a good thing, in my opinion. All that is left to do is take a look at the engineer's terminal here, telling us the likely profession of the person who lived here. It presents us with four pieces of meal. However, we're going to take a look at the archives first, as it gives us the first piece of meal, which is the one we'll start off with. It's from Cal and Troy regarding the magma flow of the mesa that was situated above this habitat, and the overall facility. Note the date is the 14th of June, 2317. This is presumably when the facility was first being set up, and then five months after this, they discovered the properties of the obsidian, as detailed in the first slate we've seen. It also tells us that Joe may have been working here for over three years. The second piece of mail is from Callum Troy, and occurs again on the 14th of the month, this time in March 2319, almost two years after the initial plans to deal with the magma flow. This is the first mention of robots here, telling us that, before this, they were likely absent. They were installed on the upper section, and he puts it forward as a way to increase productivity and retain safety. Given it's magma they're dealing with, I would say it would vastly increase the safety of humans, as they don't need to be around it anymore. The third piece of meal shows an... escalation. This time it is from a, and I will definitely mispronounce this, Swan Nagel, with the subject of glorious resistance. This occurs on the 27th of May, 2320, over a year after the first mention of the insertion of a robotic facility here. We learn that this all originally started as a team effort, and now Callum wants to fire everyone. I also want to point out that this occurred just under five months before Joe was let go. So given what we know right now, either the resistance did not go well, the firing was very gradual, i.e. Swan was let go, and then after that it was one at a time over time, or they weren't well liked and nobody listened to them. The other option is the dates were wrong on Joe's show's slate, and this is what we'll talk about later. Swan then talks about going up there, presumably to the top of the facility, and confronting him, Given we know he continued to fire people, this doesn't seem to have done anything. Entry 4 shows that if the previous entry was an escalation, this one was the shit completely hitting the fan. It is titled Flee for Your Lives, and occurs on the 20th of May of the same year as the last one. So, literally the next day. But on the same day as the previous piece of meal, apparently two employees, Arthur and Molly, were killed by Callum's robots. Swan thinks they need to flee the planet. When they say Callum might send his robots down to the settlement, that, to me anyway, implies that up to this point, they were either still at the top of the mesa, like he said they would be, or they stayed in the facility at the other side of the trench, which we shall look at later on. The final entry is in the same day, and the bed has been well, and truly shit. It's from Callum, and it says leave, and don't come back. It states that if they do not leave the planet, they'll all die. Now this paints Callum in a pretty bad light, and it makes it out that, when confronted about letting people go, he went mad and killed everyone, using his robots. But this isn't the whole story, so for now, I'll ask you to withhold judgement. Now, given this information, Joe's show shall henceforth be known as the Big Show. The reason? Because in response to his co-workers being murdered by robots, and being threatened that if he didn't leave the planet, what did Big Show do? He continued to work for five more fucking months, until either the AI or Callum calculated the only way to stop this man was an official letter of termination. The man's pension was worth more to him than his life, and there does not exist a scientific method to quantify how few fucks he gave that the robots decided to rise. All joking aside, I feel like that entry was meant to read 2319, and 2320 was a mistake. So given they were all apparently in danger, what happened to them? Well, if we walk past this habitat, we can find out exactly what happened. Complete and utter 
slaughter. We can find the first victim of aggressive corporate restructuring, just outside the habitat, from the blood. They were injured in some manner that pierced or split open their body. There are no weapons or anything else lying around them, and all that remains is a skeleton, making any type of meaningful defense unlikely. Don't worry, I know you have questions. So do I, and we'll get to their strange appearance very soon. Just past them, we can find another two skeletons. I will assume there are three possibilities here. Either A, they were lovers and died in each other's arms. B, friends or family and were trying to escape together. Or C, they were enemies and one of them thought, well, if I'm going to die, I may as well take you down with me and tackle them to the ground, resulting in them both being killed, as opposed to one of them managing to flee. I mean, they could have been Arthur and Molly, perhaps the two that resided in that double bed, but the way Swan phrased it, they died up in the mesa, not down here, and we'll find other bodies there later anyway. To the right of them, we find one of the few examples of a possible, albeit not very successful, attempt at resistance. They died gripping a hammer, and there is some ammunition scattered around them, so I think it's possible they attempted to fight off the robots, even if it didn't really work out in the end. Some of the stimulants they had may have been part of a plan to use during this attempt, and can be found beside their body. Not really a galaxy brain move trying to use a hammer to fight them, but we don't really have any evidence here that anybody was a trained combatant. Past them, to the left, is another skeleton, and I guess the remaining fifth of another? Honestly, I have to wonder if the rest of it just didn't spawn or clip through the ground or something. Either way, we have two more victims here, bringing the total up to six so far. Not much here to tell us who they were, or whether they attempted to run or fight, but I feel like the end results speak for themselves. We can find the rest of the settlement here, likely where maintenance and repairs were carried out. Onto the stairs at the end of it, we find yet another skeleton, now bringing the total up to seven. They seem to have opted for the hide under the stairs option, instead of inside any of the various containers or buildings here. This is likely because they didn't really have the time to actually hide or take cover, which does seem to have been the case for most people. The kitchen area we can take a look at up the stairs seems to back up the idea that when this attack did occur, it was incredibly sudden. Immediately inside, to the left, we can find the skeleton of another worker here, slumped over a table. Again, there is some blood, so their body was damaged in such a way to expel it. This wouldn't have happened if we were talking about disintegration here. I also find it odd that they died like this. It implies that somehow, despite the emails that would imply that they were all aware of what was going to happen, to some degree, they still got ambushed. That somehow, the robots got down here and got the drop on them. The second body is more of what I would expect. They looked like they at least got out of their chair when they were being attacked, and made some attempt to respond. They could have both just have been unaware of what was happening outside, I suppose. The walls may have blocked all sound, and there are no windows facing any of the victims, from what I can tell. Further into this room, we can find another slate. It's dated the 25th of July, 2319, and states that the upper level is now fully autonomous. This takes place four months after the first slate, saying they were going to be placing some robots up there to help out. This is also presumably the start of when people began to get either reassigned or outright fired. In fact, if we are to assume that the Big Show's log was meant to be 2319, then this would occur just before they were fired. It seems likely that reassignments occurred before anyone had started to be fired. So we have a facility of some description that was set up to take advantage of the lava flow at the top of the mesa. The obsidian here apparently had some extremely desirable properties, and they started to mine or to process it. Shortly after this, Callum made some attempt to automate the process, and started to reassign the employees here. Then, at some point, suspiciously just after there was talk of resistance to these changes, he had the robots begin executing the employees, or at least the ones that didn't accept termination letters, if any of them did. Whether they were actually given a chance to get off world or not, we don't know as this is the last log we find pertaining to that event. Regardless, we find a total of nine skeletons down here. How they ended up like this, I'm uncertain. The blood around them seems to make complete disintegration unlikely. Additionally, their spacesuits or other apparel wouldn't have degraded this quickly. Maybe the ones outside, depending on the environmental conditions on the planet's surface, but not the two inside. It's only been about 13 years, remember. Moreover, the conditions for this planet when I got here would be unlikely to have resulted in that for anyone outside either. 
Also, I literally think these are the only skeletons I've come across at all playing this entire game. Not a single other example immediately springs to mind, which is why I thought this place was so odd when I arrived here. After this, we can head across a bridge to get to the facility that lies before the elevator we can take up to the Mesa. It is here that we find the greatest concentration of robots, as well as a single turret. Inside this facility, we can find 10 lockers, which almost matches up with the number of bodies we have found thus far. Counting Arthur and Molly, who were presumably killed on the Mesa, the total number will be 11 dead so far. Additionally, the settlement had room for 17, which implies that some people kept their gear elsewhere, or that 7 people worked on the Mesa, and the rest here. Taking a look at this facility, it seems likely that this is where the obsidian was brought down to be processed. What is odd, however, is it looks like this was already set up to accommodate a large amount of robots. It seems strange then that the Mesa would have been automated first, but not this part of the facility. This could also explain how the robots got the drop on the workers. The ones on the Mesa didn't come down here, but instead it was the ones that were already set up in this facility and the settlement. There's also a desk here with what looks like a child's drawing on it. This makes me think that my previous thought of that small bed being for a child is accurate, which isn't great given what happened here. Also, I have in my notes here harvested organs, so I think that, at least the last time I came through here, I found some. This really jumped out as a weird thing as, well, I mean, where do they get them from, given everyone is a skeleton and this is the middle of nowhere. I couldn't find them when I loaded up the save again to get a fresh look at this place, but the Xeno Warfare attack was still there, so I think I'm just overlooking it. Perhaps you guys can spot it in my footage. At the other side of the facility, up the stairs, we can find another entry pertaining to the Obsidian, titled Obsidian Alloy, and dates the 12th of March, 2019. Again, they've dropped a 3 here, and I'm pretty sure this is meant to be 2319. This would put it just two days before the piece of meal asking for the robots on the top of the mesa. They finished testing on some new alloy with the obsidian, and apparently its properties make it quite unique in the universe, at least in terms of resistance. Now this does not seem to be Callum writing this, and I'm not sure who the other you they refer to is. However, it means that Callum may have been responsible for the idea to add the obsidian. This may have played a role in his decision to get the robots installed and possibly the later actions these robots took. Or possibly not, as later information hints at. I also wanted to show you the toilets real quick, just to confirm that no one had the indignity of being killed on one, which is a pretty common thing in Bethesda games. The last thing to look at in this part of the facility is the office of Arthur O'Finn, based on the terminal name. Inside, we can find the controls that give us access to the elevator we need, and a terminal with a single piece of meal, it's been dated the 16th of May, 2319, so several months after the initial request for robot parts. There appears to have been several such requests now, as they state that there are already robots up there that will take care of the delivered parts. This also takes place two months before the upper level was completely autonomous, so it was presumably a gradual process. They state as well that he only seems to trust the robots now, which again supports the idea that he was intentionally doing all this to force people out and get control. Now, we can take the same elevator up, and take a look at what exactly is going on up there. Immediately, when we arrive, you notice two things. First of all, there's quite a lot of ammunition here, as if someone was in the process of arming themselves. Second, there's a body bag, and she's not empty. It's also odd this is literally the only one that looks like some attempt to correctly gather the remains was made, as opposed to everyone else, who was just left where they were killed. I have a thought on who this is, but we'll have to look around a bit more first. The most important thing up here is a log we can find to the right of the consoles here. It's from Callum Troy, and it's dated from the 30th of October, 2319. This is about three months since full automation, and five months since the parts being sent up here were exclusively handled by the robots. He says something is going wrong, so we're off to a great start. Now I'll be honest, as soon as I read the code compiled correctly, I burst out laughing, as if the code compiling correctly is ever an indication that it's going to run in the manner you expect it to. Sound design, my fucking hole. After this, the hilarity continues, as, to the shock of no one, ChatGPT has taken over the facility. It then gets even better. It's locked him on the upper floors and it's assumed his identity. 
This puts a very different spin on everything he supposedly did, as this means the AI could have been forging messages for quite some time. I'd say, if this is what happened, it's been happening from at least July, given the message about complete automation being dated from there. Next, we head down the stairs to the left of the elevator doors. Down here, we find another body, this one laid out on what looks like a makeshift bed, with a book beside them. Given that no one else was meant to be up here, I think this is Callum. I think the AI got wind of his note about shutting it down, and decided he had to die. Either that, or Arthur and Molly coming up here triggered this response. As a result, he was likely the one who placed the body of either Arthur or Millie in the body bag. No idea where he got it from though. They could have had them on hand, I suppose, as they'd need some way to gather remains before they could be moved off world. Otherwise, there isn't much else to see in this building. We have to head outside to get a look at the magma flow and a few other things here before we can finish wrapping up the story of what occurred here. Now before we take a look at the magma and the other building and body here, I want to take a look at something strange around the corner to the left, as you leave by the locked door opposite the body on the bed. If you hug the wall, you can follow it around to a small section of the building that, I believe, neighbours the elevator shaft. Here we can find a very odd setup. We come across a few discarded tools, a cooler full of food, and a loaded pistol, and three more things. A plate and what looks like to me, unless I'm losing my mind, like a catapult. The last thing is a picture that says don't forget to meet Claire. I have no idea who that is, and if it wasn't for the drawing, I'd say it was a love letter or something. However, the drawing makes me think of a child. As for the catapult, well, if we look past it, we can find some shattered plates on the rocks opposite it. That, along with the pistol, suggests to me that somebody was up here flinging plates using this catapult and then shooting them with a pistol. I doubt Callum would have done this, given that they would likely have been under close watch by the AI, and would have made an effort to escape or signal someone if they could get all the way out here. Therefore, I assume this, whatever this was, was from before all this happened. It could have been a child, as we've already seen some evidence there could have been one, but we don't have enough information to be sure. Back at the platform hanging over the lava, we can see the setup they had to extract the obsidian for the use in their alloy. It is also here we confront the last of the robots, one of which is a dog model that, as far as I'm aware, only serve as combat drones. It's also here that we can find the last body. If we head to the part of the platform that has the chests with the loot in them, we can jump down below it and come across one last skeleton. I think this is either Arthur or Molly, given I am fairly sure one of them is in the body bag. It would make sense why the body was left down here, as Callum would have had no way himself to safely get down there and recover it. It's unclear whether they fell down here and died, or fled here and were shot by the robots. I think the latter is more likely, given all we have seen. Back up top, we can enter the final building here, which presumably contained most of the controls for this platform. It's here that we can find our last data slate, again from Callum Troy, dated the 24th of July, 2319, about three months before he said he was trapped and the AI had gone rogue, and only one day before the facility was fully automated. He says that a program, the one he wrote, has finished merging the AI with the mainframe, and everything is now fully automated. He then finishes by saying he can turn his focus to other matters, which, honestly, comes off as fairly ominous to me. So first of all, I can't believe he only gave it one day after the merging of the AI to state that the automation was fully functional, and asked everyone to leave the upper part of the facility. Something like that would take months of testing, and should be gradual. Yes, it does seem like the merging process took place over a period of months, given the logs we've read, but even then, testing needs to be done at every stage, and certainly not abandoned at the last one. It's unclear how long it was before the AI started holding him prisoner, as we don't know if it took him some time to get the opportunity to make that slit, or whether it just took some time to finally get to the point where it felt it no longer needed human supervision. Now, for that last sentence. So first off, the joke possibility. Other matters were getting back to playing with his catapult and Claire. The non-joke possibility. He always intended to force everyone out, using the excuse that the robots made any existing human labor force irrelevant. Now if this was the case, I highly doubt he was going to murder everyone. That would be extreme, and given we know the AI went rogue before the killing started, I don't think this is what happened. 
I think that, after July, any further correspondence we read were the AI posing his column, or at least some of them were. They slowly began to reassign employees at first. Then, if we're to assume that the big show log was meant to be from 2319, as I believe that makes sense, fire them. This also seemed to be gradual, as the resistance by the employees didn't occur until May of the following year. From the meal that Swan sent, it may be that the AI decided to kill Arthur and Molly to make an example, as it was monitoring the meal. It then posed as Callum, and told them to get off of the planet, or they would all die as well. Or Callum managed to send this out as a warning, and was killed after he did so. The employees either chose to ignore the warning, or were not given enough time to leave before the AI decided to act, cutting them all down. So today, we've seen another glorious example of why giving AI control of robots is almost always a really bad idea. This all started as a venture to exploit a rare form of obsidian, producing alloys that would make them all very rich. After the facility was up and running, Calum Troy, who it is unclear whether he discovered the alloy they were making, began to automate the upper level, which had direct access to the obsidian. He then withdrew from his co-workers, instead relying on the robots he was building to interact with them and bring in more orders. Eventually, the full automation was achieved. Literally directly after this, people began to be reassigned and eventually let go. Around this time, Callum realized that his code, which he assumed was running as intended, had apparently contained some error that allowed the AI to take over and effectively keep him prisoner here. Whether all the firings and every subsequent action were taken by the AI or him is unknown to us. He did seem to have some other plans from the last slate that we read. Regardless, eventually the employees had had enough and decided to confront him. Either preempting this or due to an unknown reason, Arthur and Molly were killed, likely by the AI, and from there, the attack on the rest of the employees began. We don't know if they hated the message sent by Callum, or the AI pretending to be him. If it was Callum, then they weren't quick enough if they did. If it was the AI, it would have to be the same, as there isn't any reason why it would warn them beforehand, and then choose to attack anyway after having done so without giving them a chance to leave. Logically, just striking makes more sense, or sending a message trying to calm people down instead, and then attacking. I don't think Callum is innocent in all of this, it definitely seems like he tried to automate everyone out of a job, and the AI wouldn't have done this if it wasn't for his actions in the first place. What I do think is that all these deaths have to be laid at its feet, either in the name of productivity or self-preservation, here at the Dog Star facility, now autonomous. This AI chose to slaughter all humans and take over the facility. <laughs>